you are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about a child star who was turned into a killer on a yacht. Now, even the most brilliant author couldn't come up with a story so insane. Did behind the scenes of Hollywood create a twisted mind capable of murder? Why was Interpol and the Mexican cartel involved? And how many people could have stopped this from happening? Now, if you don't know, it's my absolute passion to tell these stories. I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up and leaving a nice comment down below. Anyway, let's get back to the story. was 2004 in California and the Hawks family had docked their yacht at Newport Harbor. Now Thomas and Jackie were a retired couple from Arizona who were 57 and 47 and still just as in love as when they had first met. Now Thomas had been a Vietnam veteran and a probation officer and Jackie had worked retail and then she had become kind of more of a stay-at-home mother but they had met 18 years prior at a chili cook-off and they immediately hit it off because they they both loved fitness. You see, Thomas was a bodybuilder and Jackie absolutely loved going to the gym every day. It was just part of her routine. So after getting to know that about each other, they also realized that they had already both been through a first marriage and this would be their second. And Thomas was known to be this goofy, loving guy who was great with his hands and could turn a dump into a mansion. And Jackie was this playful, sweet woman who was very grateful for her life. You see, Jackie's first marriage had ended with her being a widow. She had actually gotten onto a motorcycle with her previous husband and they had gotten into a car accident where he passed away and she barely survived. There was a car coming out of a side street that didn't look and crashed right into them and so she was just very grateful to have survived. And so this was unlike Thomas and the fact that Thomas had just gotten divorced. When Thomas and Jackie met, it was instantly an abundant amount of love. They were compatible, but beyond that, it was said that Tom would walk on water for Jackie. He just had this level of respect and love for her that everybody wished for. It was completely devoted and pure. And Jackie felt the same about him. Now, Thomas did have two children who were Ryan and Matt from his previous marriage and Jackie instantly kind of fell into the role of being their stepmother. She thought of them as her own children and she would take care of them and the couple actually got married three years later and Thomas's sons were so excited about this. Now, by the time the children had grown up into adults, the couple had actually saved up to travel the world. They had worked decades for this. It wasn't like they were rich by any means. They had saved their money religiously because they knew that they had a dream that they could accomplish if they worked hard enough. And this was purchasing a 55 foot yacht that they named the Well Deserved for $300,000. Now it had two decks, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a galley. And the plan was that this was going to become their home for the next two years while they sailed across the Pacific Ocean and to Mexico. Tom, you know, like I said, was very good with his hands. So he went in and he added wooden racks in order to hold the kayaks and the windsurfers and also placed a generator inside to make sure that they didn't really have to dock that much so that they could stay at sea as long as possible. Tom had been boating his entire childhood and anytime the family went on vacation, he took them on boats. So he really did know what he was doing and Jackie just kind of let him handle that part of it. In 2002, they headed out on the water for good and Thomas said, life is just too short to put things off and one cannot discover new oceans unless they have the courage to lose sight of the shore. However, they also kept in contact with family through emails and phone calls and they also documented their trips through video. It was just kind of like they were family vloggers before that was even a thing, but they wanted to make sure that they were living their dreams and they were happy with this and they were doing things that made them feel alive. This is, this is Mike and I. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. How are you, sweetie? Jackie's coming today. Got the boat all cleaned up. And I think I'm gonna take a shower after I work out and shave my beard. Not a bad beard for 15 days, huh? Ah. So waiting to see her. This is Captain Tom Hawks and well-deserved. 
Jackie, hello. Hi, honey. I'm so glad to be home. However, two years later, this couple decided to head back to where they were from. Now, this was Arizona, but they actually docked in California in 2004. This was because they had a brand new grandchild from their son, Matt, and wanted to be as close to them as possible. They thought that it was just more important to be close to the grandchild than be out sailing, and they could still go out occasionally. There's Grandpa holding his little grandboy. I love you, Grandpa. I miss you, Grandpa. Yeah, There's yeah. a smile Tell for Grandpa. So they arrived at Newport Harbor on June 23rd of 2004, and in order to settle down back in Arizona, they needed to sell their beloved boat. So they put the well deserve up in a boating magazine or a yachting world magazine, and they were going to sell it for $435,000 because of all the, you know, replacements and amazing things that Thomas had done to the boat, and they took really good care of it. And so they instantly got a hit or a call from California, and then they went to dock there. Now, for the next few months, they actually stayed there while they got everything in order, yet on November 15th, they vanished. Family members were unable to get a hold of them. Their son said this was extremely out of the ordinary. Like I said, even when they were out on the water, they were contacting people. They would not just shut off their phones and drop off the face of the earth. Tom's older brother, who was named Jim, decided to head to Newport Harbor to check out everything for himself. And that is when he found another man who also docked his boat at this harbor named Carter. He said that he was friends with the Hawks and that he had noticed that their yacht was kind of of there but it was tied up sloppily and the engine was still in the ocean and even he knew that the hawks didn't let it get that bad it wasn't like they would just you know put things off till they had time to do it tom was very good about taking care of his boat religiously. But Carter had not gotten close to this boat. He wanted to respect their privacy. He was just an acquaintance with them. It wasn't like they were truly friends, but when Tom's brother got there, he decided to go out with him to the well-deserved, and they found a complete mess. You see, there was a towel hanging out of the porthole. There was also this canvas that was supposed to be covering the equipment that was kind of half off, and it didn't look like anything how the Hawks normally kept it. And immediately, the local police were informed of the missing couple, and they also took a look inside the boat. And that is when they went in and found no sign of Thomas and Jackie either, but they did find a receipt for Target for bleach, for trash bags, and for Tums. The receipt was for two days after the Hawks had vanished. Now, they also found a few drops of blood on board, which could have been from people, but it also could have been from if they were fishing on the boat. The chief of police decided to leave his car on the boat in case anybody came back. You know, the Hawks went back and then they could tell them the story of what had happened and why they weren't being reached at this time. And so they left the phone number and they decided to leave. They had also noticed that the Hawks had an SUV that they would drive around in California, of course, because you can't drive a boat on the land. And so they had this SUV that was silver and that was nowhere to be seen as well. Now, those around this area who were boating with him, they had a ton of friends there. They made friends everywhere that they went but everybody believed they were maybe out partying after they had sold their boat and everybody who really knew them said no they wouldn't have done that especially not without telling us and they were trying to get back to their grandchild as quickly as possible the very next day investigators got a call from a woman named jennifer de leon she asked why a card was left on her boat now, upon realizing that she was talking about the well-deserved, the cop asked her why she was on the well-deserved when the Hawks owned the boat. And that's when she let them know that her and her spouse had recently bought this boat, and this is about 10 days prior the Hawks had given it to them, and they actually hadn't been able to get in contact with them either, and they had been trying to talk to them about the fuel tanks, they just had some questions, and so Jennifer actually said, you know, if you get in contact with them, please let us know because we need to still ask them some questions. Now, of course, we know that they were going to sell the boat and their friend said it did seem like they were getting ready to sell it. We just hadn't heard on if it was official or not. So this was kind of confirmed. However, their friend, Trisha, who was actually Jackie's friend, said that she handled all of their finances while they were out at sea because they couldn't. And she said that if they got the money, they would have instantly put it into their account and none of that money was seen. Many people who said that the Hawks did have someone reach out to them from California said that they had 
talked about this 25 year old named Skylar who had come by to see inside the boat. And Thomas and Jackie were really excited about this because she was actually a movie star and she was from the Power Rangers. So they knew that she had enough money to kind of buy the boat and also it was someone famous in their presence and they were really kind of excited about that and they could forever say that their boat was owned by a movie star. Now their friends at the harbor that they had made had said that they went out a little while before this time when they vanished to kind of take a celebratory trip because they said that they were about to sell this boat. So they were going to go sailing to another island really quick. Jim, Donnie, Brian, and Vicki, this is our last trip to the island because uh, we sold the boat. And we're all having a really good time. Now she's filming us. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jackie. I'm so glad you could join us on our last voyage on Well Deserved. But around this time, Tom was actually thinking about how suspicious it was that this young human had so much money and was just ready to give it to them, especially in cash. But it was his nature to be cautious because he had once been a probation officer and Skylar had told them that she had been a child actor, did some acting, and was also in real estate. So the couple's fears were kind of put to rest, especially when she brought her wife and children and her wife was also pregnant. They were like, okay, well, Skylar does have this kind of perfect little family and it kind of comforted them. So they quickly agreed to sell this boat to them. In fact, she said she was going to start a scuba diving business to take care of her entire family with this boat. But before the paperwork was completed, Skylar asked if they could do a sea trial on this boat, which is basically like when you test drive a car, just to make sure that the owners are not telling you something and the car is actually, you know, doing horrible things and can't really drive. They just wanted to do that with this boat. And so this was actually November November 15th, the last time this couple was seen. You see, their friend at the harbor named Carter, he was going to hang out with them that evening, but Jackie had called them from the boat earlier that day, said the sea child's kind of going late, and we don't know when we will be back, so I'll let you know. However, that evening, Carter never got another phone call, and then a few days later, he saw the boat docked, but they had never come to see him. 11 days later, with no sign of the Hawks, an attempt was made to get into their bank account in Arizona and in Mexico. Then cell phone records showed that the last ping was actually at a tower outside of the Mexican border. Now investigators began to wonder if they really did travel to a little getaway and they just didn't want to tell anybody yet, or if they were forced there by someone. The problem was they didn't know where exactly in Mexico they had gone because that's the last time their cell phones pinged. Investigators then went looking for the couple who had had purchased this yacht and who they had talked to on the phone and Skylar de Leon was found and brought in for questioning. She was asked what happened that day that the sale went down and the couple had actually been gone for 14 days by this point and Skylar claimed that she went on the sea trial, she bought the boat, she then handed over the cash and the Hawks gave the keys and then left in their SUV. She also had the proof of purchase documents and Skylar claimed that she literally gave them a briefcase full of cash in a parking lot. She said that Thomas kind of asked if it was all there in that suitcase and she just kind of giggled, told him, yes, it's all there. And when it was confirmed that it was, they handed over the keys and headed off as simple as that. Now, investigators did ask how Skylar got all of this money and especially in cash. And that's when she did admit to them that she had been involved in narcotic sales in Mexico. She was only admitting it because she wanted to help find the Hawks. And she said that she really wanted to go straight for her family, nothing more illegal. That's why she was buying the boat, starting the scuba diving business so she could provide an illegal way for her children. The officer questioning her said, look, I'm not interested in any of that. We just want to find the Hawks and that's what we're interested in. So if you can tell us anything about that, that would be great. And so Skylar did. She admitted that her father was actually a drug dealer in Mexico for the Mexican cartel. And she was actually laundering money for him to buy the boat. But Skylar then said that the Hawks were actually looking for a home to buy in Mexico and around the Sea of Cortez. And that's when they asked her if she had any connections to Mexico. And of course she did. And through that conversation, Thomas and Jackie decided to sign over the power of attorney 
to Skylar so that if she found this home in Mexico for them, it would be easy to transfer the money over because she had access to their funds. Again, she had all of the documents right there. They look completely legal. They had their fingerprints, their signatures. That's when the surveillance footage at the Arizona bank that it appeared that somebody was trying to get money out of the Hawks account from, they realized that this was actually Skylar and Jennifer. They said though that the teller had basically said, I know the Hawks and this seems strange. I'm not going to give you any money, even with your power of attorney paperwork, because I know them and until this is proved by them, I'm not giving you any money. And so they actually had to leave because they couldn't get a hold of Thomas or Jackie. Investigators talked to Skylar for four more hours. She didn't appear to know anything more about what had happened. She was charismatic. She had once been a child actor, but had grown up to be a pretty normal adult and she appeared just genuinely concerned for the Hawks. All the paperwork came back as legal. The fingerprints belonged to Jackie and Thomas and the FBI said the signatures looked exactly the same. Skylar was released and thanked for coming in, but investigators were still going to be watching her family just in case. But while investigators watched her and her family, they saw a normal couple. They would volunteer to clean up at their local church. Jennifer went to work where she was a hairdresser and everything was completely normal. An investigator even spoke to Jennifer on her her own and she was saying that basically she was looking for them too. She was concerned because they had a lot of their personal belongings they wanted to give back to them and they couldn't because they couldn't reach them. At the same time, investigators were also looking into the possibility that the Mexican cartel had something to do with their disappearance. Skylar said they were in the parking lot because they were the ones who gave the money so he could launder it by buying the boat. And since their cell phones last pinged at the Mexican border, investigators theorized that they could have decided they were going to steal the money back and in order to do so, had to get rid of the Hawks. And that is when maybe they followed them out of that parking lot and murdered them. A month later, Jackie and Thomas were still missing and their son Ryan was asked to go and make a public appeal for people to come forward and have with any information and also to look out for them and their car that was still missing. Ryan went on air and he said, you know, what his parents looked like when they were last seen and also what the car looked like. This is broadcasted all over TV and that is when a call came in. A couple in San Miguel, Mexico said that they believe they knew where this car was because it was parked right next to their mobile home at a house. Newport investigators immediately headed down to Mexico and they went to knock on this door. They were just hoping that Jackie and Thomas would answer the door and, you know, say for some reason they couldn't reach out to anybody, but they were completely safe. However, that was just wishful thinking because a man opened the door and he could only speak Spanish and that is when the Mexican authorities talked to him and from what they could get out of it, he didn't know Thomas or Jackie, but he did say one name, a name that everybody knew. Skylar Daly. This didn't completely surprise investigators though, because although she seemed like a very caring, genuine person, she did have a criminal record. And she was actually on probation at this time. Now, investigators didn't immediately arrest her, even hearing about her criminal record, because she was honestly said to be that good at making you believe she had nothing to do with it. She was a master manipulator. You see, Skylar had been convicted of burglary a year prior at co-worker's home, and they were found with loaded guns and plastic handcuffs, and she actually was able to work during the day while in jail and then go back to the jail at night. But she had just gotten out around the Hawks disappearance. Now, around the time that investigators were putting this together, Skylar actually called a probation officer and asked to leave the country. Now, she was going to run. The problem was there was no bodies to make a connection to a murder or to charge her with murder. So they had to figure out another way to get handcuffs on her. So on December 17th, investigators arrived at a home, which was actually Jennifer's parents' home that they just lived in the back room of. And that is when they came face to face with Skylar. Thankfully, she had not gotten away yet, but they began to arrest her on the money laundering charge that she had confessed to herself. Jennifer was asking if she could come and kiss her daughter and they said, no, we just need to get her out of here. She was also said to be wearing an adult diaper at this time, but what the investigators found inside was going to be even crazier. The Target receipt that was on the boat, they had been looking into to find what Target it was and who actually bought these items. And at this point, they found that it was actually a man, but it was not anybody they knew. 
This was actually Jennifer DeLeon's father. And when he was questioned, he said, I didn't know anything strange was happening. They just said they were cleaning the boat they just bought and I was running out to run some errands for them. That is when investigators got a warrant to search the DeLeon home or basically just the room that they lived in. And that is when they found a few items belonging to the Hawks. Now, Jennifer had admitted that this couple had left some personal belongings in the boat and that they hadn't come to get it yet. However, these items were things that no one still alive or able to come get them would leave with a stranger. I mean, these were laptops, video cameras, driver's license, personal documents, and the strangest item found had actually nothing to do with the Hawks, but it was a card for LAPD detective Joe Behenna. So this detective actually wasn't just a detective, but a liaison for Interpol. And that's when investigators thought, why does this suspect of ours have a card for someone working in Interpol? Well, they reached out to Detective Joe and they asked him how he knew Skylar. And that is when he said that he was not surprised that Skylar was being looked into for murders because a year prior in Mexico, a man named John Jarvie had been murdered. They had linked John to Skylar due to Skylar inviting him on a business proposition to make some money and they spent some jail time together prior to that. And once they were out, John actually gave $50,000. They went down to Mexico together and that's when John vanished. However, he was later found in Mexico on the side of the road with his throat slashed. Now, Detective Joe Behenna actually questioned Skylar about the murder, and she said she had nothing to do with it, but she had heard he had been killed. At this point, Skylar's wife, Jennifer, was brought in for questioning, and she was asked if she knew anything that was going on. She was told that if Skylar was implemented in these murders of the Hawks, that she could be too, unless she talked. They could give her full immunity. However, she completely refused to give any information about if these were murders, if they had anything to do with it, and where the bodies were located. Yet, surveillance footage of her and Skylar trying to get money out of the bank in Arizona of the Hawks account showed her smiling from ear to ear right next to Skylar. Upon closer inspection of the documents, especially the power of attorney paperwork, investigators found upon looking closer that Jackie Hawks had signed her name Jackie Hawk without the S, and it appeared as though somebody had gone in later and written the S because it was in different handwriting. Other than that, the fingerprints and the other signatures were found to match the couple. They even found the notary that was said to be there when the boat was purchased. And this was Kathleen Harris, who said that everything was legal. She described Jackie and Thomas saying that Thomas was this kind of really buff guy who had like grayish brown hair and gray facial hair. And that was completely right. However, she started describing Jackie and she said, oh, she had long brown curly hair. And investigators said, wait, no, she didn't. Because although she did have that naturally, her hair at this point had been all cut off and bleached. The only thing that would have shown she had brown curly hair was something like a driver's license, which the De Leon's had. Kathleen was brought in several times to be questioned because investigators knew she wasn't telling the whole story. And that's when she finally admitted she had never met Thomas or Jackie. She was given the documents and paid to backdate them to when the Hawks had disappeared and she wanted nothing to do with anything else. She said she had nothing to do with the murder and she also said that she was going to back out because she found things suspicious the more things went on. However, they said that they would tell the Mexican cartel and kill her family. Now, even though Kathleen talked, she was said to not know anything about the actual murder, but someone else did. 19-year-old Alonzo Machain, he couldn't be located at the beginning of the investigation because he fled to Mexico. However, investigators found him and told him, look, we can make sure you do not get the death penalty if you come in and talk to us. So in March of 2005, he came in and began to talk. Now, Alonzo claimed that Skylar and Jennifer had never intended to actually buy the boat. They were going to steal it. And when they went on the sea trial, Skylar didn't bring her wife and kids. She brought two men, Alonzo and a man named John Fitzgerald Kennedy or JFK, which is actually his name. Alonzo was actually a former correctional officer who met Skylar while she was in prison and he was the guard. And then John F. Kennedy was someone that was, you know, around that same scene. He was in prison as well. And he was actually a former youth pastor who had a lengthy criminal record for attempted murder. Skylar told both of them that she was an international hitman and needed their help. She had lots of money to give them if they would just help her 
be able to carry out this hit on the Hawks, who were said to be evil. Alonzo told investigators that the Hawks believed that these two men with Skylar were going to help John was believed to be her accountant. However, the real plan was much darker. And even from what investigators were theorizing, because by this point, they did think that the Hawks were deceased, unfortunately, but they believed it was something that happened quick and abrupt and they had no chance to, you know, kind of live in that moment of horror and they didn't see it coming. However, Alonzo would tell a different story over the next six hours. Skylar and John went downstairs into the boat to, you know, fake that they were having some sort of seasickness. And, and after a while, Thomas went down to see if everything was okay. He had this weird gut feeling, and that is when he was attacked. He was tased, and then he was handcuffed. And by this point, Jackie was upstairs. She began hearing all of this, so she tried to get down there, and that's when Alonzo actually tased her and handcuffed her to the floor, too. Jackie was at this point screaming to Skylar, we trusted you. You came and showed us your kids. How could you do this to us? And she wasn't saying anything back to her. Skylar began to threaten them both, saying if they signed over the boat to her, that they would let them live. However, if they didn't, they would kill them. Now they did so, but Jackie had a plan of her own. She wasn't going to let them get away with it. Yet it was something so small, so smart, that nobody would notice right away. A simple little S that would let everybody know that something was wrong. The problem was this wasn't going to help her in the moment, it was just going to help when people started looking into these documents and realized something was amiss. But at that moment, they had nowhere to turn to for help. They were handcuffed, they were blindfolded, and they were helpless and begging for their lives. Thomas just kept telling Jackie that it was going to be okay while caressing her hand. Alonzo said that's when they sailed to Catalina and Jackie and Thomas were brought to the front of the boat before Skylar brought up something from the back. And before he knew it, they were being tied together with an anchor attached to them. Now at this point, Thomas used all the strength he had to kick Skylar and she ended up flying up in the air and down on the boat. But at the same time, John had hit Thomas so hard that it knocked both him and Jackie onto the floor. And it was believed that Thomas was actually unconscious at this point. Before the Hawks knew it, they were being thrown overboard, still alive, begging for their lives. Alonzo said after this that Skylar didn't seem to have any emotion. She seemed to be very calm and John just started fishing. The plan was is that we were supposed to basically kidnap them and take them out to sea and toss them overboard. And how was he planning to do to over to do that? Tasers. A taser. First they tasers. He thought of tasers. Okay, did he have two tasers? Yeah. He told me to get handcuffs. handcuffs. I purchased the handcuffs at a Uniform Express. And as before you got on the boat what, did you have an exact plan as to how this was going to go down? No, I wasn't paying attention. I was just talking to her and and she kind of rushes towards me and kind of leans over to see what was going on at the bottom. And she's she saying, oh, what's going on? And that's when they were actually um, holding him down. Then that's when I realized that I had to, you know, hold her. I was able to... Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Hawk. At this time, I, I walked her down to the bedroom area where Skylar told me to go get some tape from the engine room. Got some duct tape. He got the tape and he told me to tape, tape their eyes, tape their mouth. And at this point, Skylar went up and programmed the GPS system to go out. Um, he has me basically babysitting. Oh, they're on the bed. They're laying on the bed. And okay. they're handcuffed? They're handcuffed, yes. And tape and, uh, tape. over their mouths? Yeah. And their eyes? Nice. What happened next? They had them, one by one, go up to the, to the kitchen area where she was first. Um, they had her sign that a power of attorney. Then the scholar he was looking for a third anchor to, to push them over. He just got some rope, brought them to the back, tied them together. They didn't know what was going on. Now, investigators headed straight to this yacht to find out if this story was true because in the pictures that the Hawks had put up about this boat, they had seen two anchors on the back. And when they got there, they realized there was only one. 
this story seemed to be true. Now, Jennifer wasn't on this boat at the time of the murders, but this pregnant mother seemed to have more involvement than anybody really knew because the day of the murder, she spoke to Skylar on the phone multiple times. She was always smiling, especially when going to get the money out of their bank account. She knew everything happening and possibly helped in the planning, refusing to talk to police, but she was mostly guilty of making the Hawks trust Skylar because without her being there with her children, you know, being pregnant and showing that Skylar had this family unit, they probably wouldn't have trusted a lone person with a baggage full of cash. Four months after the Hawks had vanished, Alonzo, Skylar, John, and Jennifer were all arrested for double homicide. It turned out that Skylar wasn't a successful actor or even a child actor. When she said she was in the Power Rangers, this was quite a big exaggeration. You see, she had been an actor since she was young. She was cast in a few commercials, but as far as the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers TV show, they had no cast member named Skylar Daly on. It turned out this was because she was only an extra in a few shows and had no speaking parts. Now, Skylar had actually been born John Julius Jacobson Jr. in Huntington Beach. She had divorced parents and when she was five, she was living with her stepmother after her father was actually in jail for narcotic sales. When her father was home, it was said that he was very abusive. He would, you know, abuse her if she didn't comb her hair or had a pimple because he wanted her to be a star. Her father put her in all of the acting classes they could afford, but he was thrown off of set multiple times because he was yelling at Skylar. And this is because she couldn't remember her line. But Skylar's sister said that she did it more because her father would make her to make the family money, not because she really enjoyed it, but she was talented. Yet all this money that she would make would be taken and used up by her father, so she got none of it. So after this, Skylar was said to enlist in the Marines after high school and received a less than honorable discharge. By this point, she had also stopped talking to her family until her wife was pregnant. Now, acting as an adult wasn't really working out, and so she began to work as a mortgage lender, which is when she decided to steal from her coworkers, which landed her in jail. She got out right in time to see the sales ad for the well-deserved and come up with this horrific plan. All had four separate trials, and Alonzo testified at everyone else's trial in order to get a lesser sentence. Alonzo was the only one to plead guilty as well and got 20 years, but John F. Kennedy was sentenced to death, Skyler was charged with John Jarvis, murder as well and sentenced to death and Skylar's mother came forward during the trial and she really had nothing to do with her childhood at all but she said that she came from a home of drugs and orgies. She also claimed that Skylar had almost drowned in a pool and she had to pull her out. But to this, the prosecutor said, what is that like, ma'am, to watch someone you love drown? She was not tied to an anchor, correct? Jennifer was then sentenced to life without the possibility of parole and she was charged in connection to John Jarvie's murder, but she said that that was not true and this charge was dismissed. Were you planning on buying the boat? Well, we didn't really have the money. Calling Skylar DeLeon a sociopath is probably an insult to sociopaths. Jennifer DeLeon is manipulative. She's bossy. The two of them meeting were like fire meeting gasoline. You were able to fool him? I think so. You're that good of a liar? I, I hate to say, yeah, but I think so. Now, their children are now being raised by Jennifer's parents, but today, John is still on death row, Jennifer is still in prison, and Alonzo is going to possibly be released in 2029. Now, as far as Skylar, she is now on the psychiatric unit of death row. Skylar and Jennifer have since divorced, and while in prison, Skylar did come out as transgender, and now identifies as a woman. She also claimed that the real reason for laundering money and for needing money was that she was going to undergo gender confirmation surgery and didn't have enough to do so. She allegedly told the author of a book that was created about this case that she wanted to cut her penis off while in prison before the surgery happened and she did so before she was allowed to actually have the surgery. Now, it was also found allegedly that Skylar had also put a down payment on a surgery down two weeks before the murders. 
but she has since gotten her surgery and is living life in prison as a woman. But do you believe that that had anything to do with the murders? Or was that something that was kind of just underlying in Skylar that didn't cause anything to do with the murder? I'd love to know. Please be respectful about that. I wanted to make sure that I didn't misgender in this case, even though it is the killer. I know in the last video that I posted, um, I found out afterwards that the killer was beginning to transition in prison. And so I did accidentally unfortunately misgender her throughout the entire case by calling her a him and I do want to apologize for that deeply. I'm still learning every single day and I for some reason thought okay maybe since it's in the past it's okay if I you know talk about her as a male as he was identifying as that then but I know now I've talked to several people who have thankfully been so kind in guiding me into the right direction that I should always go by present pronouns. And so that's what I will do. I never mean any disrespect. I truly am always trying to learn. And um, I do apologize for that last video and how I misgendered and how that is very wrong to do. But I also have a question for you. Did Skylar's background of acting aid her in becoming this excellent manipulator that could fool even the best investigators? Also, do you believe that this murder could have been stopped? by either the notary, Alonzo, John, Jennifer. I'd truly love to know what you think about this case. And if you ever wanna watch another video from me, this is the video I last put up. And this is a playlist of my true crime videos. And you can subscribe to my channel right here and subscribe to my vlog channel right here. And then give this a thumbs up for my baby kitty who literally sat here so good the whole video. <laughs> okay, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces, okay? Bye.